Hi there, welcome back to Zebrafish Neuro. I'm Stephanie Camilla, and today we're gonna to be talking about how you can improve your core and shoulder exercises by better understanding how the two relate to one another. And of course, all the information presented in this video is in the context of spinal cord injury recovery. So let's take a look at something I hear quite often that trainers are asking of their clients. They're asking their athletes to engage their core or squeeze their core. And myself included, I used to do this all the time back, uh, back when I was first starting out. But now I feel like this is quite silly. This seems a little silly to be asking someone to engage their core when and you may not be able to feel your core or understand where those core muscles are or, or they're challenging to activate. And so I just imagine that this is a frustrating cue for a lot of you SCI athletes. One of my goals today is to give you another way and potentially a more accessible way to engage your core. And so we'll be answering this slide by the end of the, the video. While most people know where their shoulders are and maybe some exercises to uh, improve their shoulder strength, I wanna bring out some of the more fascinating components of the shoulder and again, how that relates to your trunk and core muscles. We'll be going through some basic shoulder anatomy. We're gonna be introducing fascial chains and body relationships here, understanding how to use this information between the shoulder and the core connection to create better movement. And then of course, I wanna spark some curiosity, encourage you to investigate further either through, again, your anatomy education or just this fascial trains um, theory. So I think we can all agree that your shoulders are really important. We use them all the time. We use them to communicate with our hands. We use them to interact with the world. Most of you SCI athletes are using your arms and your shoulders to help move through the world, either through a wheelchair or driving on a power chair or a walker, some sort of walking aids. For some of you, your shoulders may be the only place in your body that you can feel or use at this point. So yes, paying attention to our shoulders is super important. We use them all the time. But what does it really look like to use your shoulders well? One of the ways that we need to be paying attention to our shoulders um, is how we're using them, using them, so the mechanics of the shoulders. This refers to how the bones move around one another and which muscles are activating to create forces either to move the arm or to move an object in space. When your mechanics are a little bit off and it doesn't happen uh, exactly how we want it to, maybe the muscles are being overworked or a muscle is being used for a task that it wasn't designed to be used for, this can lead to injury, potentially. Second thing here is, I'm just gonna decrease my bubble here so we can see a little bit what's going on in that shoulder joint. But you guys can see how within the shoulder joint, we have so many tubes going on right here, right through kind of this uh, front of the shoulder kind of almost armpit area here. So let's break this down just a little bit. Those blue lines are your veins, a type of blood vessel. Those, the red lines are an artery, another type of blood vessel. The green is your lymph channels. Um, and then your yellow is your nerves. The positioning of our bones is super important because if you have all of these uh, all your shoulder joint is a little bit compressed or kind of junked up, maybe I could say, these tubes aren't going to be operating as well as they could be. You need to make sure that you have enough space in that shoulder to allow all of those nerves, blood vessels, lymph channels, all those systems to be working optimally. Just wanna drive this point home a little bit further. So if you are looking to improve your hand function or finger dexterity, you better be paying attention to how your bones are positioned, the position of your shoulders, so that you are allowing the best optimal uh, route for your nerves to flow from your shoulders, from your neck, through your shoulders to your hands, all right? So when your mechanics and your positioning are working well together, we're gonna to have a better potential to integrate the shoulder into our core connection, all right? So the positioning and the way we use our shoulders can make or break our ability to integrate into our trunk, and we're gonna go into that right now. I'm gonna jump a little bit ahead to the punchline of this video to, so that you can better understand where we're going and have a better appreciation for why some of the remedial anatomy is important to understand this concept. Our shoulders are sort of this portal that we can access and use to the rest of the body through our fascial system. So what are fascial chains? Let's talk about that. Fascial chains are sometimes referred to as muscle chains or muscle sling systems. 
Some of you may have heard the term of the posterior chain before. That's referring to all the muscles in the back of the body. So your uh, back spinal muscles, glutes, hamstrings, calves, your posterior chain. Basically, connective tissue chains connect one muscle to the next muscle and to the next muscle and to the next muscle. All right. So I sort of think of it like sausage links where you have your muscle here and you have the connective tissue or the casing of the muscle. It narrows down and then connects to the next muscle and then connects to the next one and so on. All right. Thomas Myers, he popularized this idea through his book, Anatomy Trains, and these are his illustrations right here. There are six shown here, but seven fascial trains that he proposed, plus some chains in the arms and the upper extremities. All right, so basically, let me just recap again. Fascial chains connect one muscle to the next muscle and then all the way through the body, right? They're patterns that go all the way down and up. Another way that you can visualize fascia uh, is through this kind of net tensioning. So you can see on the right side of the video, I'm pulling on the net. And then I'm also, through that, I'm creating some sort of change on the left side. All right. So with a voluntary contraction on the right side of the screen, we can then influence the tissues on the left side of the screen, even though they're not contracting. Okay. Another example that you can see and experience fascial tensioning for yourself is just by pulling on the back of the hand. All right, so I'll play this video here. So we're going to pull on the back of the hand, and you'll see that through just a manipulation of the back of the hand, you can create an effect all the way to the tips of the fingers. All right, so just that mechanical pull draws the fingers up into a little bit of extension. This is a very localized example of how fascial tensioning works, but that happens all over the body, all right? So in theory, I could raise my eyebrows and influence the, the um, big toe on my foot through fascial tensioning. All right, so we'll just revisit this one more time. Through fascial tensioning, we can create an effect on any area of the body by working through an area we already have access to. We're going to learn how we can leverage our shoulders, which we already have access to, to access something that we may not have as much access to, something like our trunk or our core. The great thing about working through fascial chains, especially in um, SCI and paralysis uh, recovery, is that it allows us to communicate all over the body outside of the traditional nervous system. So you do not need a fully functioning spinal cord to take advantage of the spatial tensioning and communication network. Pretty cool stuff, okay? According to Thomas Myers, again, that guy that popularized this whole fascial trains idea, uh, there are seven fascial trains, and today I'm going to be talking about just one. The great thing about the one that I'm talking about is that it actually overlaps with all of the other trains, so uh, it's a good bang for your buck to start with. All right, so this one here is called the spiral line. And I found uh, through my experience with SCI recovery that it best leverages the shoulders to help access the trunk. I've been saying this over and over again. I hope I'm driving it home. So depending on how technical you wanna get with your anatomy, I've distilled this down into a few different levels, all right? So right here we have the spiral line. The spiral line wraps right underneath the armpit and then crosses over into your obliques. So, Another way I like to describe this is I say armpit to abs, okay? Armpits to abs. And then if you want the more anatomical technical term, it's your serratus anterior to your oblique abdominals, all right? Pretty cool stuff. So just to show the serratus anterior in isolation, you can see how it kind of attaches to the rib cage and the medial border of the scapula on the underneath side. Again, it pulls that scapula around the rib cage underneath the armpit. And then we'll see also how it interdigitates with the oblique abdominals. So what's the catch? <laughs> Seems too good to be true. There are some parameters that need to happen in order for us to tap into our fascial system. We need to optimize the position of the bones within a joint and its mus muscle activation patterns. So in order for us to access this fascial tensioning, Again, the position and the way we use our shoulders needs to come into play, all right? This takes some understanding of anatomy, so that's where we're going to next. All right, some trivia for you. True or false, the shoulder blade is also called the scapula. What do you think? All right, that statement is true. 
our shoulder blade right here, it's also called our scapula, is this triangular bone right here that has a little bit of a border here on the middle part, uh, on the inside part, and then a tip at the bottom. It also has this place here for our upper arm bone to kind of set into the scapula. Um, so I just want to remind you that your shoulder complex also involves your collarbone right here, right in front. All right. So let's palpate a little bit. We'll start with our collarbones and um, I'll make my guy a little bigger here. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to start at the top right here on the collarbone, right where it meets your sternum. And we're just going to take your fingers or your knuckles or your back of your thumbs. And if feeling is challenging for you, go ahead and just visualize for yourself as you, as you see me do it. So we're just going to take the fingers across and feel how there's sort of this S, the spiraling of the, of the sternum all the way out to the tip of the shoulder, right? Right here. You can see it on me too. Yep. And we're going to reach around behind us a little bit and see if we can feel that it's called the scapular spine, which is this part right here um, on the left side, the scapular spine. Mm -hmm. And then if you're able to kind of even reach underneath, you can start to feel the tip of the shoulder blade right there. Yeah. Great. So now we know a little bit more about what the shoulder blade looks like. That will help us later on. All right, another trivia question for you. True or false? Our scapula attaches directly to the rib cage. And I know this one's a little bit harder. You have a 50% chance of getting it right. All right. So actually, this statement is false. And let me move myself a little bit over. Our scapula, our shoulder complex, attaches to the trunk through actually our collarbones right here. It's right to the sternum. It's the only bony articulation that our shoulder has to our trunk. The scapula is sort of this elusive uh, joint where, which floats over the rib cage, all right, and held in place by um, muscles. Let's see that right here. So this video is going to kind of show you how the bone sort of floats over the rib cage. See that space there? There's no actual bone on bone um, joint there. It's just this floating, it glides, it glides over the rib cage. So let's play with some of those movements together. So um, sitting up nice and tall, as tall as you can, we're going to lift our shoulders up towards our ears. That's called elevation. Okay, we're going to lift up the shoulders up towards your ears. Uh -huh. Then opposite of that would be dropping the shoulders down out of your ears. Yeah. Lifting the shoulders up and lifting the shoulders down. Nice. We're going to practice pulling the shoulders together there. So we're going to think about opening up in the front and drawing the shoulders together in the back. And then the reverse of that, which is a little bit more challenging, I think, for a lot of people, is drawing the shoulders apart from one another, and they sort of glide around the rib cage around the side here, okay? They don't actually just, like, separate out to the outsides of your body. They kind of glide around the rib cage, right? So we're going to slide the shoulders together. They sort of join in the back, and then the shoulders separate as you come forward. But the reason we need the floating scapula is so that when we are doing things with our arms, maybe bringing the arms up overhead, um, we have enough space to bring the arm up overhead um, and the, the scapula can kind of move out of the way. So this is my friend Mark from E3 Rehab and he had a great video actually right before I put this presentation together showing how that scapula glides. You can see how it kind of glides down and then it glides forward as he brings the arm up. So you're just creating clearance in this joint here to bring the arm up overhead. For those of you that have had shoulder impingement issues, the irritation is coming from the shoulder blade not actually dropping down enough to get the arm to come up overhead, all right? So if the shoulder blade stayed in place, you'd sort of hit the roof of the shoulder there. So we have this scapula and then we have all the muscles that sort of hold it in place. So we have the levator, we have the rhomboids, we have the lower trapezius, and we have that serratus anterior that we were talking about. Over the top, you'll have your pectoralis. You don't have to know the muscles, um, just know that they sort of suspend the shoulder blade in place. Now, the particip participation of each of these shoulders is super important, um, in addition to having a balance in the tension of the shoulder blades. All right, so if one of, your sh one of these muscles is super tight, let's just say the rhomboid, then the scapula is going to be pulled a little bit in towards the spine, and the serratus is going to be overstretched, okay? And that can go in any direction. Again, I bring this up because the position of the bones is super important for us to be able to tap into that fascial tension, uh, fascial tensioning that, that we were talking about earlier, all right? So the balance in the position of the bones. This balance of the scapula um, 
can be disrupted after spinal cord injury in, in a few ways. Of course, if you have a cervical level spinal cord injury, it's going to affect some of the innervation of the muscles in the shoulder. So you may have a little bit of imbalance in the, in the muscles there. I also want you to consider if you have any sort of surgical incision that may influence like your lat or your trapezius or your serratus anterior, maybe you had a collapsed lung, a pneumothorax or a feeding tube that kind of went into your body in those areas that can kind of create a disruption as well. And then of course, as you guys know, suboptimal chronic sitting where your muscles may be uh, tensioned in different ways as well can influence the position of the bones. Now, I don't want you guys to feel hopeless. There's so much that you can do about this. It's just important that you understand that these things can influence the position and the mechanics of your shoulder. So common shoulder alignments that I see after spinal cord injury and wheelchair use. All right, so the first one is the anterior tip or over the top, um, where or a scapular winging as sometimes people call it. Basically the shoulder blade sort of draws over the top of the, uh, the rib cage um, and you might get this because you aren't having that armpit muscle pulling the tip of that shoulder blade down so remember if you felt on your shoulder blade basically you need this muscle to keep the tip of the shoulder blade down on your back all right this can also happen when the front part of your shoulder is really tight and it's just pulling everything forward all right the next one is internal rotation so this feeling of your um, humerus your arm bone is actually rolling forward in its in the socket all right this can happen um, from again the tight muscles in the front pulling everything forward here this can also happen if you have uh, decreased tricep strength you may be sort of rolling the shoulder forward and then extending your elbow that way trying to leverage a little bit more deltoid rather than working fully tricep okay so again you might kind of roll forward so that you can get the tricep to go out that way that can i also see that happen when you're in uh, a loaded position like a hands and knees position you're trying to get around that tricep uh challenge where you kind of rotate the shoulder inward elevation so elevation and the shoulders shoulders up to your ears that kind of happens with Everyone, um, basically what happens is we were talking about how the serratus is important to move the shoulder blade underneath in order to get the arm to go up. Remember my friend Mark, he had that serratus activation to bring the arm up overhead. What happens is if that serratus is not working, you may use your neck muscles to sort of get the shoulder to come up so that you can get the arm bone to go overhead, okay? A lot of times too, if you don't have that core stability, you may be kind of shrugging up in your shoulders to sort of find the sense of stability in the system. So some of you may notice these in your own body. Again, you're not helpless. You just have to start to become aware of what's going on in your body in order to make that change. So again, to tap into those fascial systems, we need to optimize the position of the bones within the joint and the muscle activation patterns. All right, so how can we uh, work through these disruptions that we've had in our shoulders and uh, bring our shoulders a little bit more back into that neutral position. Okay, so again, first one here is moving your scapulas in all ranges of motion throughout the day. You want to be moving your body so that it doesn't tighten up and stiffen up. And the more you expose your shoulders to all those ranges, the better balance you're going to have in that kind of three dimensional float. Okay, so we're going to go over them again. If this is challenging to do just on your own power, you can lay on your back and have someone sort of facilitate that by grabbing your hands underneath your shoulders and letting you feel the movement uh, happen underneath you. If the active range of motion is a little bit more challenging for you, have someone help you experience that passively. But let's go ahead and work through them. We're going to go shoulders up towards your ears. Mm -hmm. Shoulders drop down. Think about sliding your armpits down the sides of your body. So we're going to go up towards the ears and down. Next one is going to be the retraction. So pulling the shoulder blades together. Good. And then uh, pulling them apart from one another, almost stretching your upper back. Okay. And forward. And remember, when we say apart, it's really kind of just around the sides, okay? Because you can't bring your scapulas outside of your body. It's going to be more of a wrapping around the rib cage. Before I move on, I also want to point out how important this joint is for your scapular positioning. Even though it doesn't seem like it's part of the shoulder, it's still part of the shoulder complex. And remember, it's it's where the shoulder attaches to the torso, okay? So when you think about lifting the shoulder up. Whew, the collarbone sort of aims down. You can see right here, the collarbone starts to aim down. And when the shoulders drop down, the collarbone sort of lifts up a little bit. 
All right, and then same thing when the shoulders come together and apart, when the shoulders come together, the collarbones go really wide and the, the collarbones almost come forward here. And then when you're protracting or bringing the shoulder blades apart from one another, the, sh the collarbones set back. All right, so they're kind of going forward and back. And you can see mine kind of pop out a little bit too. <laughs> yeah. So thinking about how you can wind the collarbone a little bit more so it creates this sort of circular effect at the SC joint. Okay, collarbone circles are one of my favorites. I didn't want to leave that one out. Second way to bring your shoulder more back into neutral is practicing collar, uh, wide collarbones. I say wide collarbones in my practice all the time. It's kind of this illusion that your front of your body gets nice and big. And my friend Jackson here on the screen, he's showing the contrast between a not wide collarbone and a wide collarbone. And you can see how much more open his posture looks. And the picture on the left, it sort of looks like that anterior tip and a little bit of internal rotation that we were talking about earlier. When he widens the collarbones, the scapula starts to come more on his back. So go ahead and practice that right here. Again, widening those collarbones. Use your fingers to help you create this opening sort of sensation. All right. And I know that these seem really simple, but don't underestimate the power uh, that these little simple movements can do, especially as they accumulate throughout the day. All right, ways to bring the shoulder back to neutral number three, mobilize the anterior shoulder regularly. So a lot of times we think about mobilization, maybe like you get a massage or you, as Theo is showing here, he's using a release ball in the front of the shoulder. Um, those are a little bit more obvious things, but I wanted to make it really, really easy and accessible for us just right now. So we're going to go ahead and give ourselves a little bit of a self massage, and I'm going to kind of show you all the hot spots that I want you to think about. So first, let's go ahead and take your um, self right at that collarbone piece right here in the front. So we're going to just feel some circles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do one set at a time, and of course we'll do both. And then take your fingers and just work your way right underneath that collarbone. So all the muscles that are sort of underneath. Remember, the movement of the collarbone is super important for the movement of the whole shoulder. Don't forget it. And it's really easy to access. Mm -hmm. Yep. Awesome. And then getting a little bit more in the interior delt here, right in front. Good. And if you want to give your serratus a little bit of a wake up, you can kind of just go ahead and give it a pat there. Let's do the other side. So again, circles and then right underneath the clavicle. All the way to the other side. Yeah. Especially right here, that big deltoid that gets a lot of attention and pushing. Mm -hmm. And then you can wake up that serratus by just giving it a quick tap on that side. Nice. The important part about the, the reason why we want to start integrating the two, these two pieces, the shoulders and the core, is so that the shoulders don't always have to take the brunt of the work. We can kind of distribute the work a little bit more among the entire body. And then that's going to decrease injury in the shoulders and just make you feel more powerful and efficient in general. All right. So let's go back to this spiral line. Again, the shoulders to core, armpit to abs, serratus anterior to obliques. That's how we're going to leverage that serratus anterior down to our abdominals. So again, this is assuming now that we have good positioning and good mechanics of the shoulders. All right. The serratus anterior is best activated during upper body loaded positions. So uh, we're gonna try it right here and see if we can activate a little bit more of that serratus now that we have everything kind of primed and ready. Go ahead and rotate your body towards your desk. I'm just gonna show the, the elbow version of it, all right? First, we're going to think about pulling your heart forward, okay? So we're gonna draw the heart forward and sort of float through the crown of the head. All right, and then go ahead and relax out of that. We're gonna just do that two more times. So pull your heart forward and lift through the crown of the head. Okay, one more time. Pull the heart forward and lift through the crown of the head. Good, nice. Second thing we're gonna do is think about pushing the table away. So we're gonna push through and push the table away. And you can already start to see in the camera just a little bit how my armpit muscle is starting to work a little bit. All right, so we're gonna rock, kind of relax, reset, and then push the table away. You can visualize your 
shoulder coming forward that way. Let's try that again. One more time. Push the table away. Good. Now we're going to do those two things together. So pulling the heart forward and pushing the table away. Go ahead and draw the heart forward. So we're finding the lift through and then we're going to push away. So those two pieces together have a really good combination to get your serratus into your armpit muscle to work for you. All right, let's try that a couple times. So we're going to pull the heart through and then push the table away. Good. Nice. One more time. Pull the heart through, push the table away. Lovely. Nice job. Now there's a lot of different positions that you can do that in. Uh, I chose the table just as a quick way to demonstrate that for you, but you can do it in a prone position just on your elbows, either on the floor or on your bed. Uh, this position may be a little bit um, contraindicated for anyone that has rods in their spine, so just be smart. Know if your spine moves that way. Um, if your spine doesn't move that way, you can pad your hips up with a little bit of pillows and stuff like that so that you're more level in the spine and your elbows can still load. All right, here's another example of uh, maybe a more advanced example of how you can load through your serratus in a quadruped position where you're rocking forward and rocking backwards, loading through your upper upper body. And then the arrows are kind of showing, again, that serratus like push through. I understand that uh, loading through the upper body um, can be hard for everyone. So this is the basic idea. If we need to pull it back just a little bit further, sliding the armpits down to the hips. All right. So if you're just laying on your back and you're in bed and you want to start working on that serratus connection, go ahead and just draw the shoulders down the sides of your body, slide your armpits down towards your hips, and that's going to start tapping into your serratus. All right. You can do this with bands, but you can also do this without bands. All right. So again, this arrow is showing that armpit slide. So this is all great. Exercises are great, but we need to also understand how we can use this information to improve movement efficiency and core connection. So how do you integrate some of this stuff into your daily life? What does it mean for some of the movements that you guys are doing uh, day to day? All right. Theo here is going to show um, uh, how he uses his serratus in doing a pressure relief when he is kind of um, bowing out to the side. I'll let him show that. Something low on the ground, I'm using a foam block, but it could be anything. You're gonna put your weight over it. Notice my shoulder is coming up and my ribs are kind of sagging down toward the floor. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull my shoulder back and press it down. So I'm creating tension along the side of my body there. Um, I, can, I can already feel the serratus and muscles on the back uh, igniting to support my ribs in that way. Yeah, and then another way that you can use that serratus connection is to do your pressure relief, your normal pressure relief where you're pushing down on the chair. So Theo's gonna show us that again. Uh, one way to do this in the wheelchair is to press up and notice that I'm keeping my elbows locked and my shoulder blades are going from a high position down to a low position. So this is doing serratus and a bunch of stuff on the back as well. Um, so a really nice, way to just make sure you keep the shoulder blades back and uh, down as much as you can. Great. So again, that's that armpit slide that we were talking about, the elevation and the depression that we practiced earlier. So now you can see how those, are, those exercises are related to maybe something that you do on your day to day. <clears throat> Some of you who work with uh, resistance bands in your workouts, you can visualize this, I call it a scapular scoop, when you're reaching the arms forward. Again, this green line is showing how you can drop the shoulders down and then draw the serratus or draw the scapula underneath and, and alongside the ribs as you reach forward with your arms. If you wanna try this while pushing in your wheelchair, um, it's a great way to start feeling how you can get more power by integrating the shoulders and the core to help push, create that push. Real, real crazy, go ahead and slide off the back of your wheelchair and see if you can still make that push happen with ease, all right, without leaning forward too much or falling backwards into the backrest. Kind of a fun drill for you to try. With all this information, basically what we're saying is that your core now becomes a contributor along with the shoulders. So instead of just using your shoulders as your prime, maybe mover through the world, we can start to integrate uh, your core with it because we now understand the connection between your shoulders and your core. 
we're also saying that the core and the shoulders are now inseparable. They're no longer two entities. So anytime you're doing a core exercise, you're also doing a shoulder exercise. And anytime you're doing a shoulder exercise, you're doing a core exercise. As long as your shoulders are working in a good position and optimal mechanics, we're able to tap into those fascial systems. All right, pretty cool. So we had this question at the beginning of the slide. Remember, trainers asking you to engage your core, uh, squeeze, your, squeeze your abs. Um, but what does that actually mean, right? So now we can answer this question a little bit better and say engaging your core really just sort of means integrating your, your shoulders. So squeezing your armpits, slide your armpits down your side. That's going to reactively engage your core through your fascial system. So just changing either the vocabulary that your trainers are using with you or for your self-cueing, for your self-cueing too. All right. So let's revisit these objectives. Let's see how we did. We reviewed some basic shoulder anatomy. We introduced this idea of fascial chains and body relationships to better integrate the body. And we took this information and applied it to a few things in our daily life, like pressure reliefs and pushing the wheelchair, and also just how to make your exercises more integrated. But most of all, I hope this sparks some curiosity in you guys to learn more about your shoulders, the mechanics and the anatomy of your shoulders, and again, these fascial lines. Um, they're a great avenue to look into for reconnecting and rediscovering how your body relates to one another and creating movement efficiency. This shoulder to core relationship is just one of the many integrated patterns that we use in our approach for SCI recovery. Imagine your potential for bodily reconnection if you just learned and leveraged just a few more of these relationships. If you're interested in learning more about how you could harness this potential, our book on SCI recovery discusses this topic and many more applications. Check it out at zebrafishneuro.com book and make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and our newsletter so that you can be the first to know about upcoming webinars and new video releases.